Good afternoon. So today we're going to begin entering the realm of the topic of experimental design. And you've noticed we've been getting um, more and more involved experiments. And as we get more involved experiments, um, the more important experimental design becomes. And this first topic I want to talk about um, is an element of experimental design having to do with something called pseudo-replication and statistical confounding, two related concepts. And <clears throat> I guess I'll first define the concept of pseudo-replication for you. It sounds like replication, but kind of false, right? So that's not far off. Pseudo-replication is replication that looks like reputation, re <laughs> replication, but uh, the variance within groups actually yeah the variance within groups uh, is falsely small in other words you're using the wrong end for the for the denominator of the variance formula so um, <clears throat> and um, as a result of that, when we look at um, when we look at comparisons among means, for different groups, these comparisons may be uh, uh, show false differences between groups that are not actually due to our intended uh, treatment effects. Okay, so what exactly do I mean? by this. Um, so let's imagine we have a statistical universe here um, and we're talking about, I don't know, a field and um, we want to uh, compare treatment effects on individuals that are spread around this field. Now we know that if we are trying to um, understand the effect of treatments on these individuals we should randomly number these treatments and randomly assign treatments to particular individuals, right? So, for example, if we have individual uh, receiving treatment A, they would be end up being spread around by chance, and individuals receiving treatment B should be randomly located. And I'm not doing it randomly here, right? I'm doing it what's called haphazardly. Um, I'm not assigning random numbers to these points and then randomly assigning treatments as I should. Instead, I'm just kind of making it look random <clears throat> for the purposes of this illustration. Now, if I want to compare the mean for group A, some treatment A, to the mean uh, to, for group B and the mean for group C, this is my null hypothesis, right, that they are equal. And I could do an ANOVA to test that null hypothesis. And I might find that the ANOVA suggests that the, the support for that hypothesis is very small. Oh, I don't know. You know, I might get that. P equals, usually don't do less than some weird number, but P equals 0 0.0012, you know, with some F value that's very high. Uh, and, and I'm showing that there's a significant difference and I can reject my null hypothesis, my chance of being incorrect and rejecting it is very, very small. So, um, if I've randomly assigned treatments to individuals, what that means is um, the treatment effects I'm seeing are independent here, and I can do that test. In other words, every individual had the same probability of getting treatment A, treatment B, and treatment C. And so, I'm not likely to have a bias in terms of these means that I calculate. All right. Now, let's imagine a different experimental design. So we have a field here, and it's impossible, um, beautiful field. It's impossible to uh, design a uh, treatment that would be applied to each individual for some reason. Let's imagine we had to apply fertilizer in liquid form, and we had to spray it out over this field, so we couldn't easily do it uh, on each individual. Now, often there is a way of applying treatments, but sometimes it's very difficult and you can only apply treatments to plots. So let's imagine, for example, we have 
plot A, plot B, and plot C, each receiving different treatments, A, B, and C. And then we go out and we find random individuals within these plots that each receive these treatments. So these get A, these get B, and they're random individuals, right? So everything seems like it ought to be okay. And we have individuals getting treatment C over here. Whoops, <laughs> what am I doing? Bad, bad, bad. C, 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 I'm talking and writing at the same time and not thinking. Okay, so we have here um, three treatments being applied and they are being applied uh, in separate plots because it's convenient to do so. So why can't I just do an ANOVA here? Okay, well, there's a good reason. Um, that's because I not only have treatment here, I have plot. Now, if I hadn't applied different treatments to each plot, do you think there would be a chance that there would be a difference in some y variable between a's, b's, and c's, even though there was no treatment effect? Sure, what would that be? That would be the plot effect, right? You expect variation spatially um, for a, an animal or a plant that's out in the field like this. So let's say we're talking about salamanders here. Maybe this is sort of a dry end of the field and this is a wet end of the field and so they have different kinds of food and they grow different amounts. And so even though we're talking about the same species here, um, we're getting different means due to different environments. And often these plot effects are, are environment effects. But then we go out and we apply a treatment. So, you know, this might be nit low nitrogen level. This might be medium nitrogen level. And this might be high nitrogen level. So can you see the problem? When we compare y bar A to y bar B to y bar C, we have an issue. <laughs> and the issue is one of attribution. So to what do we attribute the differences here? Is it due to treatment? Or is it due to plot? The answer is, we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea. Now we could go out and start measuring things like soil moisture and so forth, but is it ever possible to measure enough things to know that there was no plot effect? No, not usually. Um, so that's the beauty of the previous design. The previous design, we had randomly assigned treatments so that Spatially, there was no bias in the assignment of treatments, and therefore we could assume that on average those differences were zero. We cannot make that assumption reasonably here. In fact, the more we know about biology, the more we know how sensitive organisms are to the environment um, and how you know we would expect differences. Okay, so what is the different what is the problem here then? We can analyze these data just fine with a one-way ANOVA, but we have treatment effects and plot effects are what are called confounded, which basically means they are all wrapped up together and they can't be separated. So when we do our ANOVA, sure, we can put in treatment. We can tell SAS jump, hey, go tell me whether there's a significant difference among treatments. But honestly, if we're being honest about it, we should call that treatment slash plot. And when we get an F test and a P value associated with that F test, we won't know whether it's due to treatment A, B, C variation or due to plot to plot variation. Okay, so that's statistical confounding. Um, it's also, in a sense, pseudo replication because we are saying we have uh, N equals six, N equals seven, N equals six here. But do we? No. Why? Because they are not independent of one another. In fact, they are tied together um, by space, by being within that plot. And these 
seven are tied together by being within this plot, and these six are tied together by being within this plot. So it's actually very interesting um, that we don't actually have an n of six and an n of seven and an n of six. It's a false, uh, a false statement to say we have those n's. In fact, we have what's called pseudo replication. Now, you know, some people would tell you we have an n of one. And it's true, we have an n of one mean for A here and an n of one mean for B. Um, there's my tufted tip now, sorry. Uh, and then we have an n of uh, six for C here, but one mean. But we don't truly have an n of one. We don't have no statistical power. We just have kind of an unknown amount of independence here. We have some independence, but not real independence. We can't really do a test because we don't know how independent these are. Um, so, what do we do? I mean, we take care of that by randomization. We could put our A's just and, uh, you know, spread out our A's, B's, and C's. We could have the same N. Um, seven, oops, C, 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 C. Okay, we could have that same uh, array we talked about to begin with. But, but what if it's actually really difficult to control things that way? What if you can't apply treatments like that? For example, what if you wanted to apply a temperature treatment to a set of plants? What's the best way to do that? Well, you might want to use a growth chamber, for example. Okay, so here's a growth chamber. And you want to apply temperature treatments. And of course, you're going to line up your pots if you're growing plants or your um, petri dishes if you're growing yeast or something like that or your flasks okay and so you know you set this at one temperature say 10 degrees C and you set this growth chamber over here at 15 degrees C and set up all your replicates in here uh, now, by now you should know they're pseudo replicates <laughs> and um, you could compare these, but you would have exactly the same problem we had in the last case. <clears throat> now you might say, wait a minute, I can set the growth chamber so that I can control relative humidity equals 70% and relative humidity equals 70% over here. And I can have the light level being equal to 400 micromoles of photons and the light level <clears throat> of 400 micromoles. And you could have, you know, the zero wind speed <laughs> maybe um, and you know I'm being a little facetious here it's actually very difficult to control things exactly the same even if you had the environment perfectly controlled you know what if you have to go into that chamber and you have to change something what if, can you leave the door open exactly the same amount of time well that changes the relative humidity are you going to leave it open the same amount of time as you do over here no so what do you need to do well what you need to do is set up multiple growth chambers at each temperature and you would have then uh, two growth chambers at each temperature and you can still put replicates within but I'm going to show you later on with this experimental design how to compare temperature um, given the fact that you have these growth chambers okay so that's but you can take care of the issue by having replication so we have multiple growth chambers at each temperature and then we can compare them. By the way, we should randomly assign temperature to each growth chamber, right? Because we don't want to bias it in some way. Um, so we should randomly assign the treatment to the experimental unit. In this case, the experimental unit is our growth chamber, which happens to be housing multiple plants or petri dishes or whatever. Okay, so be very careful as you're designing experiments to avoid pseudo replication and by the way, you can have also pseudo replication in time. So let's imagine you wanted to compare drug A to drug B to drug C in terms of effects on some organism. All right, so you would not want to on day one 
apply drug A, and on day two, apply drug C to a set of patients. Let's say you had n equals 10 patients, all right? And on day three, uh, apply uh, drug B. Looks like I've nicely randomly assigned them to days, right? But remember, day and drug assignment are completely confounded. I have assigned only drug B on day three and only drug C on day two and so forth. So these things are tied together and to the extent that there are differences among days in terms of uh, the effect on whatever Y variable we're measuring, that, could, that is totally confounded with our drug effects. For example, there are a lot of people um, who feel good on sunny days and get arthritic symptoms on rainy days. And so, you know, they're going to feel good on one day and not so good on another. Well, what if day two happens to be a rainy day? Okay, so people are coming in feeling bad. Um, so at least a portion of the population is. Maybe it's only 10% of the population, but drug C is going to look terrible because it happens to be a rainy day outside. Okay, so you don't, you can get these kinds of biases, these kinds of confounding effects uh, if you're not careful with experimental design. So it's just something to think about. When you do an ANOVA and you tell Jump, I'm, I'm looking at the drug effect, and you've set up the experiment this way, you're looking at drug slash day. And it's not uh, truly replicated with an N of 10. Okay. By the way, um, you know, sometimes there are citations that everyone cites on a particular topic. And the person that gets cited most often on pseudo-replication is Hurlbut, Hurlbert, Stuart Hurlbert, um, in a famous paper in published in 1984 in Ecological Monographs. The interesting thing is the subject of this paper was uh, ecological field experiments, but it applies, as I mentioned, to growth chamber experiments, greenhouse experiments, um, all kinds of experiments, uh, bench experiments, uh, tri clinical trials, all kinds of things. So this issue of pseudo-replication is way more widespread than Stuart Hurlbert originally uh, documented here and showed us the importance of, but even his limited uh, field of view um, resulted in that paper being cited 5,868 times as of the moment of this recording um, in October 2013. So that's an incredibly high citation rate, and um, Stuart Hurlbert is famous for his um, explication for the field of ecology of the importance of pseudo-replication. All right.